Um, great to see everybody. My name is John O'Bake, and I, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is my second time in Sweden. Um, I was here a couple of months ago. It's my first time in Stockholm, and thank you, everybody, for, for, for gracing me with your, with your presence. So, um, quick introduction to who I am. Um, that introduction pretty much covered it, but I... I work as the Ubuntu Community Manager. Ubuntu is a very large community of people who collaborate on building a, a software platform. Um, but I'm really passionate about community and how communities can bring out the beauty in human, in human beings. So uh, I, I run this consultancy practice where I work with organizations, but I've been wanting to further the industry and the profession of community management. Um, it's a very, very young science. Um, so I wrote a book called The Art of Community and run the Community Leadership Summit every, every year. I put the, the Art of Community online. It's available under a Creative Commons license as well as in bookshops. So you can go and download it for free if you want as well, because my view is, Community management is a, is a skill that we as human beings should be able to possess that you shouldn't need $40 in your wallet to be able to go, and, to go and buy. So it will be no surprise that I'm here to talk about this. Um, I think communities are wonderful, wonderful things. And they, they, they open doors to things that go beyond our wildest dreams. But let's start right at the beginning, because I'm conscious that we have a very, very diverse audience here. Um, so most people, when they think of communities, they think of things like this. Uh, people who get together in coffee shops and they read books and they have interesting conversations and most of the women are called Doris, most of the men are called Dave. That's usually how it works. And we think of communities as being these, these small groups of people. Traditionally, they were these kinds of small groups of people. Um, but the advent of technology has meant that people can collaborate much, easy, much easier with each other. And that's opened up the opportunity for us to collaborate uh, as, as global communities as well. One of the finest examples of this, of course, is Wikipedia. Um, Jimmy Wales, who keynoted yesterday, had a simple idea. Why don't we document all of human knowledge? It's pretty ambitious <laughs> to do that. Um, but Rest assured, I mean, that, that, that effort is ongoing, and it's tremendous, uh, the, the achievements that the Wikipedia project has, has, has managed to achieve so far. And what, but fundamentally, those communities are people who are generally interested in communities getting together to do these things. If you contribute to Wikipedia, if you contribute to open source, if you contribute to Ubuntu, you're probably a bit of a dork as it is. You probably know what communities are. You probably know the technology to be able to, 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 be able to collaborate together. The thing that really helped kickstart a lot of this was social media. Social media has had a profound impact on the world. Now, there are many people who work in my industry who read a little bit too much into social media, that it's going to completely revolutionize the planet in every possible conceivable way. I wouldn't take it that far. But social media has had a, has had a profound impact because regular people can get access to a network in which they can communicate outward with other people. And, and it's, an additive, it's an additive medium. When you have a Twitter account, um, very rarely do you lose followers. You constantly aggregate more and more people, so the value of that, of that network becomes more and more valuable as you use it. And this, is, this has triggered things that have stepped outside of the computer and into real people's lives. Things like the Arab Spring is a good example of this. Uh, significant regime change in a very challenged part of the world wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for social media networks. Now, of course, while social media has brought wonderful things to the world, it's, there's some disadvantages of it as well. I mean, unfortunately, I, I'm always reading about this guy. Um, but you know what? You take the rough with the smooth. So, so getting back to, to community. So communities are, are groups of people who do stuff. right? There's all kinds of social science that goes into understanding how they work. But they're fundamentally just people getting together to do interesting things. Now, my view is that, they've always be, that, that, that communities and, and creating communities is an art form. And that's the reason why I called the book The Art of Community, is that it's not it's not engineering. It's not just getting people together to use tools to create something. It's an art form. And as an art form, it means that we can be creative. Uh, uh, the, the previous keynote from Jen I thought was interesting because I think her point, um, the points that she was raising in her presentation, the points I'm raising here are very much interconnected. What we're interested in doing is unlocking the creativity in people. Uh, and traditionally, creativity has, has flourished in people. But getting that creativity out so other people can appreciate it, that's been the challenge, and that's where I think communities can, can afford as many benefits. So to me, art and communities are very closely connected. Um, and art is all about unlocking creativity. Um, now, people are creative in lots of different ways, and art is just a single term that describes 
the, the premise of creating interesting things. Some of you will be interested in graphics, and music, in writing software, in sculpture, in games, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. The point is, is it's people creating interesting things. So I've been interested in how do we get groups of people to create interesting things and to unlock the opportunities that we have to be more creative. So to break this down, the way I tend to look at it, I look at, the first of all, the creative process. The creative process is basically broken into four areas. The first thing is that we create things. You create a song, you create a piece of artwork, you create a piece of software, whatever it might be. We've been doing that for donkey's years. The challenge is the next piece is sharing it. Now, traditionally, for example, with the music world, sharing music was, was challenging. It was you had to get a record deal, pretty much. Um, or you had a cassette tape with a really bad recording on it that all of your friends pretended was amazing. Um, I speak from bitter experience in this regard. Um, because what you do is, you, the, there's some artists out there and they say, I only create art for me. Those people are full of crap, right? Most people want to create art for it to be appreciated by others. That's the real pleasure in creating art. Um, so we want to, the purpose of sharing, we, we, we really want the response of appreciation as well. And that makes the whole process more, more rewarding. So how do we do this? Well, my th philosophy here has been the way in which we learn as people, whether we're talking about community management, whether we're talking about game theory, or whatever it might be, the way in which we learn is through stories. Um, I've been here this morning, I got in last night, and I've heard already loads of stories from people who I've met here. Stories about what people are doing, or things that are happening at the conference, and things like that. In every story, there is a little nugget of information, there's a lesson to be taken. And when you tell your own stories, you'll find that you will, you will also have a little nugget of information that's designed to be shared with other people. Um, so, my view is, the way in which we improve ourselves, the, the way in which we improve our lives and we learn how to do things better, is by sharing stories. The more stories we share, the, the more stories we share, the, 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 the better the exposure that we get to, to different people's experiences and ideas, and that makes us better at what we do. So, in applying that to community, I'm a very, very simple person, and I have to break things down into simple pieces, right? So, um, I'm gonna be telling you some stories today in this presentation, which is how I'm gonna get over some of the points that I'm trying to make about how we, how we build great communities. But bear in mind that this is just one person's set of stories. I'm no expert. I mean, I've, been, I've had the pleasure of working in community management for the last 15 years, and I've been lucky enough to be able to be in a situation where I can work with big communities that a lot of people don't get an opportunity to, to, to work with. Um, but I'm just one set of ideas, and everybody here has got a tremendous amount of uh, knowledge that can be shared there as well. So all communities can be broken down into effectively two types. I call them read and write, okay? Whether it's the ladies in the book club, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's the Ubuntu project, whatever it might be, they can all be broken into these two types. Read communities are like these people, Star Trek fans, okay? Now, before I go on, is anyone in this picture I used this picture at a presentation once, and the woman was in the audience. <laughs> it was awkward for a moment. <laughs> um, so Star Trek fans, what they do is they get together and they consume together. So you know, these, these folks, they organize conferences, and they, they have these wonderful outfits, and they make fan fiction, and they do all these different things. But fundamentally, they don't, they don't influence Star Trek itself. The creators of Star Trek are the people who, who create Star Trek. So these people effectively get together in communities just to consume together. And these communities are relatively straightforward to set up. And this is the reason why MySpace exists, and not that anyone uses MySpace anymore. Uh, this is the reason why Facebook pages and Google Plus communities and things like that exist. It makes it easy for us to meet other people who we have like-minded interests with. Um, right communities are very different. These communities, and one such example here is Ubuntu, uh, communities where we get together, um, we, we, we get together, uh, something brings us together effectively. So Ubuntu will bring somebody into the community, and then somebody will realize that you can actually improve and enhance that product as part of the community. So people learn about Ubuntu from their friends, they download it or they buy, buy, buy a device with it on, and they start using it, and then they realize, hang on a second, I can improve this? That's really cool, that's really empowering, and then they join the community. The community management associated with this is much more complex. We have to have tools and processes and different 
levels of access to repositories. We need to make sure that people aren't duplicating work and things like that. There's a lot more project management and complexity and strategy that's involved in these kinds of communities. So I started learning about this. As I said, I want to tell some stories today. I started learning this about this uh, really in kind of two, uh, 1998, 1999. In 1999, I moved to a very boring town in England called Wolverhampton. Uh, this is the best possible representation of this town. It is tremendously dull. The people there are very nice and friendly, but it's really boring. And I moved there to university. I went to a, a not very good university because I was frankly stupid back then. And um, <laughs> still stupid, to be honest with you. And I... I, I, I I was getting interested in Linux and open source, and I, I wanted to meet other people, and there weren't any other people uh, that, I could, that I knew within my group of friends who were interested in this. So I set up uh, what's called a Linux user group, and this is a, a picture of our handsome group of individuals who joined the Linux user group. And basically what we did is every two weeks we got together in an Indian restaurant in Wolverhampton, and we had a curry. And people would join who were interested in this, and we would have a curry, and we'd drink a certain amount of beer, uh, and we just basically enjoy hanging out with each other. And it was fun, you know? It was, it was not meant, it was not a career decision, it was not strategic, it was just fun. And uh, anyway, this group of people formed, and as I got to know them, there were three or four of these people who I really enjoyed hanging out with. Uh, the rest of them were kind of okay. Um, but these three or four people I really enjoyed hanging out with because they had really passionate ideas and opinions, and we used to have some of the most interesting discussions. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if we took those discussions and made a radio show and put it on the internet? Now, back, back in 2004, 2005 time, well, actually, it was 2003, um, the concept of podcasting didn't really exist. It was, podcasting is when you create a, an audio show and it automatically downloads it to your iPod, basically. Uh, we just had the idea of doing a radio show and putting it on the internet. So, we started this show called Lug Radio. And Lug Radio uh, went, on, went on for a while. Uh, but the, uh, the basic premise of it was four idiots talking about open source for the mutual enjoyment of people who listen in. It's, it's basically an audio car wreck. It was the idea of this. Um, we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We'd never done this before. Uh, but our core philosophy here was we don't want to be too professional. And what I mean by that is uh, the traditional radio, Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, Radio 4 in England, was very, very uh, straight-laced. It was very conservative, not politically. It was just very, very formal. And we wanted this to be fun and anarchic. And we weren't constrained by radio. We could swear if we wanted to. If we wanted to tell dick jokes, we could do that on our, on our show. There was no reason why we couldn't do this kind of stuff. So we started... We started out with a philosophy of we want to define our own culture about how we do this. We didn't want Lug Radio to be this. Okay? I've got nothing against this lady. I'm sure her radio show is very interesting. We wanted it to be like this. I don't know if anyone's seen Top Gear here, but it's, it's, it's the greatest show in, in the world. Uh, um, and our idea was we want to basically model it on this. And we started doing that. But we had a bit of a problem. First of all, we didn't have an audience. Uh, and the reason why we didn't have an audience is because we didn't have a way of getting the shows to people. You know, I mean, as one such example, we'd record a show, it would be about an hour long, and we'd have a high quality and a low quality MP3 and a high quality and low quality OG file. And what we'd do is we'd distribute that. In total, it was about 200 megabytes an episode. So for one person to download an episode, they'd download a quarter of that effectively. Um, if we, we did some numbers. If we had 1,000 people download it, which was a crazy idea, 1,000 um, people would ever want to listen to this. That's, a lot of, that's a, lot of, a lot of data. And back then, we didn't have the ability to distribute it. The third thing was, how are we going to get people interested in this? We didn't really have any method in which, we, in which we could differentiate ourselves as being interesting. So these were the three areas that face all areas of creativity, whether you're doing art or podcasting or whatever else is how do you get your audience, how do you distribute your artwork, and how do you get publicity around it? And this got me thinking about how we distribute, how we, the, the creative engagement that we have. And it basically looks like this. We have an audience up there, and they connect with the creator, with the creator of the art 
via unit of consumption. Now that unit is one of our episodes, or it might be a song, or it might be a game, or whatever else it might be. To create that unit of consumption, what we do is we have ideas and creativity. We had loads of ideas and loads of creativity. Um, and to create that unit of consumption, we need tools, licensing, and a distribution model. Now we had tools. I have a, I'm a musician, I have a recording studio in my house, so we could do that. We could license it through the Creative Commons, but we didn't have a means of distributing it. So what we did is we created a community around this. And what we did is we basically said to our community, we're gonna record an episode and you people distribute it for us. And one by one, people started listening to the show and signing up. And we had the ability to reach out, get our content out there to lots and lots of people by everybody participating. It was effectively, it was a straight to video, peer to peer network is the way you can think of it. Uh, we set up forums to get the community together. We, we engaged with listeners. We'd regularly le read out letters and emails and things like that on the show. We'd, we'd have little in-jokes and reference people, because that meant people felt part of something. Because even though it was just four of us in my little studio recording the show, the fact that there was a show and you hear your name read out in it, there's a certain romanticism around that for a lot of people. Um, we created our culture that it wasn't professional in terms of content. We weren't formal. We were very, very professionally focused in terms of the content and in terms of the audio production. Um, but fundamentally, what we did is we united our audience around a mission, a mission that we were going to create something that's different, that's fun, and that's interesting. And this opened up all kinds of opportunities. I mean, a good example of this was the live events. We never, ever thought we'd ever do these. These were just events where people started listening to the show. We'd invite people to Wolverhampton, of all places. We, we invited the, the guy who runs all the open source at Google to Wolverhampton to speak, and he flew over from California. And, uh, and I said to him, what did you think? And he said, I'm going to write a blog entry about it. And when he went home, he wrote a blog entry on urban decay in Wolverhampton. It was, uh, it was not good. Um, what's interesting about this picture is if I zoom in, uh, there's a gong there. So as a one such example, we brought the culture of the show to, to, to this. And we had, it's a long story, but we had a guy in a thong who would, there'd be five minute presentations and he would hit the gong at the end of every presentation. Um, it's just one stupid idea that we had, but this vehicle meant that we could do this at, at, you know, at, at our live event because we'd been able to define that culture. And the result of this was five years, 108 shows, two million downloads, six live events, uh, a couple of awards from, from some podcasting magazines. So we wrapped up the show because I moved to America in 2008. Um, in fact, we have a new show out called badvoltage.org, so I wanted to put a plug in for that. But one of the things that was most interesting to me about, about Lug Radio that, that, that was close to my heart was the way in which we licensed it. Um, we have this concept called the Creative Commons, which is basically a way in which people who give out art can, can license their work. They can say, I want this to be, you can remix it, you can provide it uh, commercially. Um, there's different options with how you can license this work. So for example, with Lug Radio, we license it under this license, the CCBYSA. This basically said you can download it, you can share it with all of your friends, you can remix it, you can put it in your own stuff, you, could just, you can use it commercially. Just make sure that when you use it, you say that we created it. It's just attribution, effectively. To me, this is a really powerful concept. I'm a big, big I've been a long supporter of the Creative Commons because I'm a musician. Um, well, I try to be a musician. Um, and one of the challenges with music is that the industry is wrapped up in these three labels. Um, Universal, Warner, and Sony. These three labels own basically all the bands in the world, pretty much. And uh, the challenge with this is that when you're a musician, when you create a band, you basically, what happens is you, you, you create a band, you, you record an album, and then you try to get a record deal. And these folks are basically just marketing. They just go out there and they market it for you. But there's not a lot of money in marketing. So what happens is these bands, they sign to these labels, and they don't get the marketing that they deserve. And therefore, they don't really go anywhere. So I had this idea, well, what if I was to create a band that gives all of its music away for free under the Creative Commons license? So I set up this band called Severed Fifth. Now, if you're into heavy metal, you might want to check this out. If you're not into heavy metal, I suggest you don't check it out. It's pretty heavy stuff. Um, and basically what we did is we, we applied, took a band and we applied the community process to it. So when I was writing the music, uh, I'd stream it live on Google Hangouts, as an example. Like the there was technology available 
to me back when I did this that wasn't available with Lug Radio. Regular engagement with people. People would make fanzines and, and wallpapers, and people would print out uh, posters of the band and go and put it up in their local libraries and bookshops and stuff like that. Um, Media-rich material. We, we create material design for these kinds of folks, lots of audio and video. Um, consistent branding would have a street team with street team logos and all kinds of stuff. Again, it was all about uniting people around a mission. And to me, this is the most important lesson um, that communities need to focus on, is when we get people excited about a thing, it can be, it can be changing the world via open source. It can be um, documenting human knowledge. It can be helping kids to... Uh, to, to be more intelligent through gaming, whatever it might be, when we unite people around that mission, we all work together in a community to do things, and then that makes incredible things possible. So our mission here was to record an album, and we effectively crowdsourced this. We raised five or six thousand dollars and went into a studio, and what we said to our audience was, if you fund this, we will provide the music available for free. So what happens is that your ten dollar donation is not just helping us to record an album, it's an investment in the creative commons. It's you're, you're effectively investing in music that other people can reuse as well. It's not just Severed Fifth. People can put it in YouTube videos and on their own podcasts and whatever else. So to me, art and community closely align because it's the value of the, 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 value of the many over the singular. I could, I could make a podcast today. I can write a song today. I could make a, an image today, whatever it might be. I could write some software today. But if it's just me, then I'm limited by what I can do. If I have five other people who we work together on something, we create something that's more valuable than the five of us put together. And that, to me, is the essence of what we talk about with community. Now, throughout this time, I've been blessed by the fact that I've been working on the Ubuntu project. I joined Canonical seven years ago to, to, as the Ubuntu community manager. And this has been a tremendously beneficial experience to me. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book and, and the conference and stuff like that is because I think the lessons there are lessons that are valuable to many other projects and communities as well. Now, for those of you who don't know what Ubuntu is, it's basically we're, we're creating a platform, a, a single ubiquitous operating system that runs across multiple devices. It runs on phones, tablets, desktops, TVs. Um, and the community are right at the heart of how we're doing this. The software that we're building, the community are actively participating in building it. And we have a, a fairly large community, so we have over 20 million users. This just kind of paints a picture. We have a, over 20 million users, 100 teams who are working on different things, documentation, translations, whatever else. We have about 200,000 active contributors on a weekly basis who contribute into the community. Um, over a, nearly 2 million people on the forums, 150 local user groups all over the place. We have 17,000 translators. That's just one team, as an example. You know, a ton of Facebook fans. We, we released a version of Ubuntu one time and knocked the uh, Nordic weather system um, offline which was a, a, a personal achievement, I felt. Um, so um, most recently, we, we started building this thing. It's the Ubuntu phone. Uh, <laughs> one guy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, we announced this on the 2nd of January. And uh, you know, we basically said we're building, this is kind of like an equivalent to Android. Um, and basically, what we said was we're going to build this device. Uh, it's not a device, it's software that can run on your existing phone, for example. Um, but we said, we need the community, we need to work with our community to build um, the apps and the services and other pieces that fit into it. Like, we can build this shell. But with a phone, you need a calculator and a calendar and a weather app and those kinds of things. We call these ritual apps. They're the kind of things you use on a daily basis. So on the 2nd of January, when we announced this, I, we, we also announced uh, that we were looking for community people to come and participate in this. Uh, and we said, if you've got experience in QML, which is the technology we used to build it, fill in this form, and we'll be in touch. Uh, in three days, we had 1,500 people fill that form in. Now, I'll admit, some of those people had a little bit more excitement than experience. Um, but of those 1,500 people, there was a lot of people who were very, very good who are really motivated by, the, by what we were trying to do here. Because Ubuntu, Ubuntu is an ancient African word, and it means humanity to others. And since the beginning of the project, it's, we're, we're, at, we're about building a platform that will always be free, it will always be available in your language, it will be available to people irrespective of ability or disability. It's building, again, a communal operating system that everybody can use. 
and we wanted to extend that to this. So what happened was we basically set up and we said, okay, let's build these apps. Uh, fast forward six months, and 11 apps have shipped, 150 people contributed to this project. We effectively did the project management then had people get together. Uh, we did the project management so people could write the code. Now, again, if it wasn't for uniting people around that mission, this wouldn't have been possible. But a key point here is that we've got to make it easy for people to join. And I developed this thing called an on-ramp, which is basically the four things you want to do. If people know that their community exists, that's the first thing. One, identify that people can come and collaborate. But then people need to develop the knowledge. They need to develop the skills for, OK, how do I learn how to contribute to this particular project or this particular team? But once they've got those skills, what do they work on? We need to give them things to do. That's the reason why we had very, very tightly scoped work items that are assigned to people, things like that. But then the final thing, and this is where a lot of people miss out, is that we need to grow kudos and excitement and recognition of the people who do contribute. Because our overarching goal here, my philosophy here has been, we don't want to, I could create a community today and people could join, uh, and they could last a week. We want communities that, that that build significant and sustained contributions. It's people who stick around for a long period of time. That's the real communities that we want to build. Um, because the, if, we, if we have people who participate in the project for an active and extended period of time, they feel part of something. They feel like they are actively uh, playing a key role in how, in how we deliver that particular part of the system. Um, and what this all boils down to, and if there's one thing I'd like to recommend all of you take away from this presentation, if nothing else, is that the way in which we build communities, the way in which people participate, and people stick around and provide significant and sustained contributions, is when we build belonging. When people feel like they belong, that they're part of something, they will prioritize it above pretty much all else. And that's one of the most key, the most key points. So just to, just to wrap this up, um, Oh, that's a big screen. Um, art and community is very similar. Um, and communities infuse ideas. Um, when we get people together, we, we have better ideas. In the same way that the best albums in the world were created by collaborations, not by a solo artist. Uh, communities make art a lot more fulfilling. When you, when you bring a community in to participate, it keeps the creator motivated and excited. It, it gives us the ability to do more with our artwork. Um, but we need to unite around a mission. Like going out there and getting someone motivated and excited about what you're trying to do is the, is the key thing. And the way in which we can do this is through telling stories. That's the way in which we share our ideas and our best practice. Challenge the bottlenecks. We would never have been able to do Logredo if it wasn't for getting over the bottleneck of distribution or Severed Fifth if we, didn't, if we had the issue of how we fund the album, things like that. And these are just tiny examples. These are not world-changing examples. Um, build belonging is the key thing and then obviously create an on-ramp as well. So that's me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jonah Bacon. That was an interesting speech, and I all recommend you to, to read. Please stay just a couple of seconds uh, to, to read the book. It's uh, really inspiring. I have it on my desktop. So, Jonas, can I ask you to enter the stage? And uh, we want to hand over this piece of art that Jonas had provided for this event. Only unique. So, thank you very much. Jonah Bacon. Yeah.